This is Duke University. And if we could let, let folks know who are outside that our time on target is 15, 15. Yeah, could you guys um, herd, herd the cats? Young students aren't exactly like young captains, but they're as close as I can get here. <laughs> very, very glad to have their assistance. Uh, what we're going to do for our, um, our last panel is very unique. And uh, we're really privileged to have our international partners with us. And I'm going to uh, just give them a very brief introduction, because what I'd like to do with this, with this panel is that we're going to, um, we're, I, I'm going to ask each of them to talk, reflect really about what's happened in the last 10 years in terms of coalition operations and particularly the role of the military lawyer and the role of legal advice in, in, um, in military operations because quite, quite candidly, uh, it has evolved since uh, some of us in the audience served in uniform and it, it's a very sophisticated architecture now. But there are challenges, and I'm going to ask the, our panelists to look towards the future. Our, our first panelist is Commander Hugh, Hugh Cameron, uh, recently arrived to U.S. Central Command. He's a legal officer in the Royal Australian Navy. He's, uh, he has all kinds of degrees, <laughs> including an LLM. Uh, he was appointed an officer in the Royal Australian Navy in 1993 after uh, attending the Australian Defense Academy. But I think importantly, he has deployed a number of times. He served in uh, the Multinational Corps of Iraq, uh, two, two postings in support of the Maritime Interception Force in the Arabian Gulf. He's, uh, he was in the Australian Defense Force Operations Division during the period leading up to Operation Iraqi Freedom. And he has, uh, as I say, he's now a legal officer serving with U.S. legal officers at United States Central Command, which is the command which is responsible for the operations in the Middle East, including recently completed operations in Iraq and, of course, the ongoing operations in Afghanistan. Commander Cameron. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gents, and uh, General, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, looking at my panel, I think we're missing... Uh, is the translator around? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, uh, I bought my wife, uh, and my wife can translate anything that I can't understand. But look, Listen, I, think I, the, I, uh, I heard her, her accent last night, and it's, uh, we need translators for translators. We do. <laughs> and uh, look, I think the only thing we're missing is an Irishman, and then we've got some great jokes. But uh, <laughs> in the absence of that, I guess it's me and lawyer jokes, which, uh, which we won't take too much further. But look, the, the language thing is unique, and I think Winston Churchill cracked in World War II. Yeah, the, the, the difference between the English and the Americans, of course, is uh, are two great nations separated by the English language. Uh, and indeed, we see so much of that um, today. And when uh, Mr Woods was talking earlier today about gum on the floor or on the ground, I thought he was talking about a gun. Uh, <laughs> and um, I, too, would have stopped to pick up the gun because I think it's... <laughs> I think it's a really bad start to detention operations, but um, <laughs> apparently it wasn't a gun. But uh, look, essentially, what is a coalition? I don't know really what a coalition is. Lots of people have got an idea about what a coalition is and what are uh, international operations. General John Allen, who of course many of you know is Commander uh, ISAF and Commander US Forces Afghanistan, uh, General Allen believes that it's his strategic centre of gravity. Well, that's great. Uh, it doesn't really help me define what a coalition is, but it sounds important, and coming from him, it must be important. But I think, importantly, what are coalition operations historically? Well, they tell me that over the last 10 years, which is the, the time frame that uh, the General was talking about, but indeed the last 20 years, 
I believe that coalition operations have been the mainstay of how we do business. Um, I won't say that it's the only way we do business, and for every great rule there's an exception that proves the rule, but I think if we look at so many operations, there is some type of coalition. From the Australian perspective, that includes the first Gulf War or Desert Storm, it includes uh, the Maritime Interception Force operations, it includes Somalia, it includes Timor-Leste, Afghanistan, Iraq and the Solomon Islands, just to name a few that Australia have been involved with. In terms of the humanitarian assistance and uh, disaster relief programs, they're not on their own either. And we don't tend to go and do these things as single nations. And I think of Haiti, and I think of the uh, initial earthquake in Pakistan followed a couple of years later by the floods. I think about the 2004-05 Indonesian uh, tsunami and then earthquake, and of course recently the Japanese earthquake and tsunami. A quick snapshot of where military operations have occurred with uh, a huge connection to coalition operations. But it's going to continue. It's not just a historical perspective backwards. It's not a justification of what we've done. These type of operations, uh, coalition operations, are going to continue to go forward. And there's a whole host of reasons why, in my opinion, noting the General's comments from earlier this morning that I'm not speaking on behalf of the Australian Government, nor in fact CENTCOM, so these are my opinions. But why do these coalitions uh, operations exist? Well. Um, sometimes it's for mission accomplishment. From the Australian perspective, we can't do all of these things on our own and we need some people that have got a bit more heavy lift power to help us do our operations. A controversial one, but a uh, very pertinent one, is mission, mission legitimacy. Getting some people on board makes your operation look a hell of a lot more palatable to the rest of the world. There are those, of course, who want to play on the coalition because they want to participate on a big stage. They may not do much, but they do like the feeling of getting up there and tap dancing. <laughs> There's also those who like working in coalition operations because of the training perspective. Those who benefit from it, either economically, or politically, or for another reason. And dare I say, those who like to participate in coalition operations for intel gathering purposes. Uh, I don't think they're spies, I think they just like to keep an eye on what some of their closest friends are doing. But what that says to me, because you can't quite define why people participate in coalition operations, is that everyone comes at it from a different purpose. When some people come at it from a different purpose, they bring in their own different, bizarre, strange rules of engagement. Sometimes countries show up without rules of engagement and, in fact, they don't know what rules of engagement for the battlefield are like. Mm -hmm. And, unfortunately, when we play in this strategic field and we think it's a great idea to get country X on board because they can give us something, they think it's a great idea until we ask the question, how are you going to fight the good fight? Now, according to various numbers that are bandied around, and it's always hard to ascertain these things, but uh, for the uh, global war, the global action on terrorism, there are about 70 countries who make up that good fight. There's 20 plus countries that are contributing troops uh, in Afghanistan or the, re the regions around there. And there's somewhere between 57 and 63 coalition partners currently at CENTCOM down in Tampa, Florida. Uh, I can't quite ascertain that, so we'll call it 60, because it seems to be a number that fits nicely in between them both. <laughs> but look, there are a fair degree of uh, frustrations that permeate out of a coalition operation, and in fact, on the 8th of April, the chairman of the coalition village down at CENTCOM, a brigadier, uh, not of US forces, not of mine, and not of anyone that's been represented on the panel, so you can't ask us any difficult questions about what the guy was thinking, because I'm not attached to him in any way. But he, uh, he had a story that appeared on the front page of the Tampa Bay Times. And it was echoing his frustration at the coalition and the way it operated, and in many ways, CENTCOM. And he said that there's not enough information that's shared. I could do this from my uh, cabana back home or my desk at home. We need to do more. We can't uh, segment key areas and hive them off and hope that we all understand. Now, is that unique to uh, his frustration or, in fact, CENTCOM? No. 
In fact, in my opinion, it's got nothing to do with CENTCOM. I think if you went to any coalition operation anywhere in the world, you'd have the same frustrations regardless of who was running that particular operation. But of course, it's a lawyer's job to analyse lots of information and then to turn that information around into a product that a commander can use. But as a coalition, we don't do our best to enhance the job of the lawyer or make it easy. Maybe that's the ultimate commander's revenge to make it as difficult as a lawyer as possible. <laughs> but we think about things like IT systems. I know talking to my friends on the panel, we, we all have a frustration with IT systems. I can't see what many of my US colleagues and friends are seeing on their computer systems. I can't look at many of the documents because they are unfortunately stamped no fawn. I'd like them to be stamped yes fawn, but the no fawn, <laughs> the no fawn stamp is bigger than the yes fawn stamp. <laughs> there are also problems within the trusted Five Eyes community. So of those 60 partners, we accept that there are many of those 60s that we like having on board, but you know, we probably don't trust them too much, but we have those same problems with this trusted Five Eyes community. And an example, if I was deployed to what we would parlance in the Australian community as the Middle East area of operations, Australia tells me when I'm not in Afghanistan, so I'm in another country, that the US standing rules of engagement will apply to me. There's just one slight problem and I can't see those because they're a no foreign document. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my defence and that's what I'm sticking to. <laughs> So look, we have seen, having said all of those things, a huge improvement in coalition operations over the years. When we think about Kosovo, and I accept that Australia didn't have a role in Kosovo per se, and I think about many of those case studies that have come out about some of those frustrations and targeting issues, and you then compare that to something that I was involved more closely with in 2003, you can see how far we've come as a coalition to try and sync these things. When we went into East Timor, the Interfed operation there attempted to design rules of engagement that covered all of the coalition partners in Interfed. It was a great idea, but it didn't work because people have differences as fundamental as, can you use lethal force to protect property? And, and the coalition thankfully didn't splinter, but there was a huge differential on what the coalition thought. So clearly we had to pick very carefully who we would put in which areas to defend uh, critical property. When I think about uh, your Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, for us, for whatever reason, oh, sorry, Operation Iraqi Freedom, for us we called it Operation Falconer, um, we did have many inroads. And we did share a lot of information in the lead up to uh, the invasion of, of, uh, of Iraq. The sad thing is, as that invasion took place, we were still playing catch up because neither countries, none of the countries, I'm sorry, would be sharing their classified rules of engagement. And by the time we'd hit 2003, the American lessons out of Kosovo had come so far that they had started to develop really good targeting doctrine, which forced Australia on the back foot, as we were using our fighter jets for the first time in operation since the Vietnam War, to also come up with a targeting doctrine which would have been really useful to have worked on 12 months prior to that invasion. When I think about uh, what the British were doing down at multinational uh, division southeastern Iraq, and I think about the terrific job they did, one thing sticks in my mind, and that was a particular mission that the US had to execute down uh, in the British territory. And the British, much like Australia, have some very careful rules about what force can be used again in the defence of property. And it was a, an issue that went up and down the food chain, and that was in 2007, and by that stage we'd been in Iraq for four years, and there wasn't an easy solution about how the US forces would operate in the British-controlled South East Division. And of course we come to Afghanistan today and indeed we start thinking about issues such as warning shots. And every country has their own opinion on whether warning shots should be used or not used. I have an opinion that whatever goes up must come down, so you have to be very careful about any warning shots that are used. But, you know, what does this mean? Well, we like to, tr we like to teach our military to train, to fight, to win. And that's really hard when you keep changing the rules on them. 
Many militaries will practice with warning shots, many will not. So what do we do when we all come together? Are they in or are they out? So going forward, what does it mean? Well, I'm also a realist to know that we will never get universal agreement. When I think of the fact that the six states of Australia, let alone the 50 states of the United States, probably can't agree on what education road rules, business rules and tax rules can apply, I'm not uh, as naive to think that we, as an international community, can come up with rules of engagement that suit everyone. I think there are some terrific inroads being made by inst institutions such as um, the Defence Institute for uh, International Legal Studies, for the Asia-Pacific Centre for Military Law, uh, for the Military Law Centre, for the ICRC and the IIHL. What would I say to all of those institutions and indeed to many of the academics that are here today? I would say we need to go on. We need to go the next step from analysing things that are purely academic. Mm -hmm. We need to go beyond writing papers about how we interpret the protocols, about what our thought process is on the ICC. Uh, I mentioned the International Criminal Court at work the other day and they said, what is this thing you talk about, the ICC? Wash your mouth out with soap. So <laughs> I say it here, hopefully among friendly audience. But th the reason for that, as many of you know, is that the rules of engagement, in my opinion, work far faster than any, poli sorry, any uh, international legal world can catch up. And we know because rules of engagement come about through policy, through law, through politics, through national caveats and through capabilities on the battlefield. And these are changing as quickly as a government changes, as quick, quickly as a balance of uh, power in parliament changes, as quickly as interest groups get into someone's ear, rules of engagement are changing, and these are the things that many of the legal brethren in uniform that I can see before me today have to deal in coalition operations. And we need to spend a fair bit of money, and a bit of time and some resources to make sure that our coalition is well placed, to make sure that we've gone beyond the academic interpretation of international law and we start getting some good coalition practical experience. And I'm hoping that's about 15 minutes. <laughs> your, your time on target is perfect, actually. There, there's a challenge, Rob. <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rob Preston, our, our next panelist, uh, he's actually a Colonel Select he'll pin on here in the not too distant future. He's currently the staff judge advocate at the 4th Fighter Wing, which is over at Seymour Johnson in North Carolina. And he, uh, interestingly enough, he started his military career as a Marine, enlisted Marine, as an aircraft mechanic on F-4s. You and I may be the only, well, there's a few people who might know what an F-4 is. Uh, <laughs> from, it did have just one wing. It's hmm. not two wings that some, some of the troops think. Uh, Rob... I think very interestingly, he was the senior military lawyer until uh, he took the position in the 4th Fighter Wing at our uh, Combined Air Operations Center in, uh, the, in the Middle East. And in fact, that's the last time we, we had seen each other in the AOR. That is where the military operations, uh, the air operations anyway, are planned in, in the command center for their execution. And we have another panelist who also served in, at that location. We'll talk about her in just a moment. Uh, Rob also uh, worked at our Doctrine Center, the Air Force Doctrine Center at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. And he was also an instructor at the Air Force Judge Advocate General School. And he's a graduate. He has his JD from Texas Tech University and his uh, LLM from George Washington. Rob? Thank you, General. And, uh that's how I know uh, Professor Dunlop, and um, you know I, I like as I was talking to my wife. It's sort of like uh, sitting on a panel with uh, your high school coach and your <laughs> co favorite college professor and your faculty advisor and uh, maybe your first boss and your father-in-law, and that's all wrapped up in one person. So excuse me if I uh, seem a little nervous. Um, <laughs> the uh, you know very much appreciate being here. Very important topic, and you know. Uh, are you sure anybody's going to show up for this thing? I mean, it's, uh, this is wonderful. Um, and by the way, from an international credential standpoint, um, I come from the strategic hamlet of Kenosha, Wisconsin, which was briefly a uh, protectorate of Illinois when Canada invaded Thunder Bay. So, um, but no, 
the point of emphasis and the thing I'd, I'd like to talk about, and I'm going to make a few comments based on uh, other presenters today, is, is really the emphasis on this very U.S. audience here and taking the, the benefit and appreciate the fact that we have uh, our coalition brethren here uh, and, and the wave of the future is us looking to them, not them looking to us, okay? Um, you know, one of the first maxims you probably teach your kids after, hey, pretend like you like what grandma put on the table, even if you don't really like it, is <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it's what? It's how you play the game, right? Except that when, you come, when it comes to national security, the fact of the matter is we have to win. You know, and it's not melodramatic to say when you say security, you're really talking about survival. All right, um, and, and there's, you just need to ask Lebanon or the Balkans or, or many other uh, geographic locations in the, in the world to understand that fact. Um, you know, and answered uh, Professor Morris's uh, query this morning, you know, how do you reconcile the Revolutionary War and the Civil War? Uh, Hard to, but one way to reconcile is to say that the nation survived, you know, and a set of principles survived, and, and, and we were able to build on that. Um, at the same time, you have to counterbalance it and, and talk. Uh, uh, our great panelists this morning made, made wonderful points about, uh, on the other side of the coin, is, hey, patriotism is the refuge of scoundrels, right? Well, so is sometimes the excuse of national security. So uh, another layer that I think this panel brings to this discussion is, you know, we're, we're talking about national security, and, and we're talking about the, that, that balancing act there, but, but how do you actually implement national security? And, and you know, we're, we're the implementers, you know, in part, uh, and really at, at the forefront of the discussion because military force or, or force in general is, is such a big part of that discussion. Um, and there, there's a real concerning part from a standpoint of someone who wears the uniform uh, of whether or not we really understand as a country um, what truly are our capabilities in, um, in terms of wielding force? Um, and, you know, there's a risk among the military, among the national security established that, that we're talking to ourselves. You know, that, that there's as much as the, the world is interconnected, as much as we have, you know, these wonderful media resources, that there's really not a depth of understanding of what military capabilities are and realistically what can be accomplished. You know, General Dunlop mentioned my time as a United States Marine, and I distinctly remember 1988, almost 24 years ago now, uh, standing on the tarmac and having a uh, sergeant uh, shout in a very loud voice, there are 300 Soviet divisions poised to attack the United States. And I can't really account for the math. And he said, <laughs> and there's 179,000 Marines standing against them. And in those days, Goldmar Nichols was really not much of an emphasis, so we kind of <laughs> left the Army out of it. Um, <laughs> what are you going to do? And the response was, kill, 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 kill the commie for mommy. And uh, I can assure you there was, was really not a, a much of a debate about that at that time if you wanted to get your snack after dinner. Um, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is it kind of illustrates in a, in a very succinct way that uh, while our threat was serious and even scary, it was relatively simple. And as we fast forward and we go through the, the examples of Desert Storm and, and the Balkans, hey, we're, we're talking right now about 20 years anniversary of the Balkans. You know, there's, there's stacks of, of wonderful uh, books and, and uh, uh, analysis done on, on the Balkans and, and what a complicated situation that was. You know, uh, great work by Halberstrom and Bergram and, and many others. Um, you know, the problems we have in, in Afghanistan or, or, or other places sometimes make the Balkans look like a inner city dispute between two prep schools, you know. Um, and, and, you know, as, as we developed, you know, uh, two gentlemen sit in this room, among others, uh, uh, at the time, Colonel Scott Silliman, and I'm guessing maybe Major, Major at the, not Major General then, Major Dunlop were jags on the ground in Desert Storm in, in our first big coalition operation that, that Hugh mentioned. And, and as we started getting into this, this era of very complicated uses of force, of quote, limited uses of force, this is also when you started to see uniform judge advocates become part of the equation. The generation before us, before General Dunlop, um, would often talk about this quote, seat at the table, you know, uh, the, the fact that in, in the Vietnam era and even earlier, really uh, judge advocates were not part of that strategic discussion. And, and Desert Storm started us off on that foot. 
Well, as we go forward, obviously uh, the peace dividend uh, that we thought would happen with the Cold War didn't quite happen. Uh, things became increasingly complex. And you know, after the turn of the century, as strange as that sounds to say, um, we started to realize not only were we not going to realize the benefits of the peace dividend, but that our downsizing, our lack of, of you know, our inability to sustain this large military capability, as well as the increasing complexity, the challenges, meant that, that we couldn't do it alone. You know, and, and as we sit here today, um, what we, I would say about our, our esteemed panel here and looking around at our, our various uh, um, forces representative, you're looking at a good start. You know, you're looking at, at a small portion of a much larger uh, coalition of, of people we have to work with, with, with very complex relationships, um, you know, sometimes uh, more, more uh, concentrated bonds than others, and, and, and wield that all in, in increasingly difficult um, settings. You know, as I learned to uh, point my rifle in the direction of the enemy, who I thought I knew what he would look like, um, we're asking the 0311, which I also was at one point, an infantryman in the Marines, and, or the 11 Bravo, his counterpart in the Army, um, not only does he have to point his, his rifle and, and take out an adversary, perhaps, he also has to perhaps be involved in eradicating malaria or increasing literacy rates or uh, many other things. And, and you, you really have to ask, you know, how, how much can our military establishment punch above its, its weight, like all of our, our coalition partners punch above their weight? You know, part of the answer is we have to have an understanding of what our capabilities really are as we have this discussion. The other part is to understand that, that we can only do it together and that um, because of the expertise that's brought to the table, because of where these conflicts occur, we may not lead. You know, uh, we, we, may, we may follow uh, others. Um, we may be the, in the supporting role in those contexts. Um, General Donnellan mentioned the, uh, the uh, Combined Air Operations Center at Al Udeed and, and that very uh, um, elaborate and robust uh, system we have for managing air operations in, um, in the CENTCOM area, which would include Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, what's very prominent in that uh, Air Operations Center is the coalition. You know, and, and we can, we can uh, talk at some length, and I, I will yield to my colleagues so we have time to do this, uh, about the fact that one thing that's very prominent in the new um, coalition operations is the fact that our interaction very often occurs through people like who you see sitting at, at this table. You know, certainly there are the, the, the leaders on high, there's the soldiers, sailors, Marines on the ground from the various coalition countries, but very often that interaction, the, the understanding that, that uh, comes about that is necessary for these operations occurs through folks like this. And uh, with that, sir, I'll yield my time. Thank you very much, Rob. And, and Rob, really, uh, and all, all of the people here, it, you know, it really is, we talk a lot about the practice of law, but these are individuals who've had to make literally life and death decisions in an instant and make legal judgments in an instant. And it, it is really just remarkable that we have such talented people in our coalition. Among those talented people is our next speaker, Major Steve Stricke. Steve is a Canadian Forces Judge Advocate. He graduated from the University of New Brunswick and on the Dean's List in 1997. He also went there for law school. He was in private practice for a while, and if he wants to share with us why, how he ended up being in the forces, uh, he will. He uh, has been on two deployments to Afghanistan with the Canadian Forces, and I particularly asked Steve to uh, tell us, especially we in the U.S., to help us see ourselves as others see us. And uh, Steve is getting his LLM here at Duke uh, Law School. And he's been just a terrific student. We're really, really happy to have him. And he's brought so much to the discussion. Steve? Thank you, sir. Um, as General Dunlap mentioned, I'm, I am an LLM candidate here. And I just want to thank General Dunlap, Professor Silliman, Professor Morris. Just the, the pleasure and honor it's been to be a student here. Unfortunately, it is coming to an end. Uh, I said to myself that I wouldn't leave until I received uh, one million hockey jokes. I'm close, <laughs> very close. So I think I'm uh, on track for my posting uh, back to Ottawa in July. So keep it up, panel. You're almost there. 
Really, uh, as General Dunlap alluded to, I mean, uh, my perspective uh, to give you today is really from the other side, from the, the, uh, the operational tactical side of a legal officer in a coalition, a smaller military force that is deployed with the United States and other coalition partners. I've had the pleasure of deploying with the United States twice uh, in 2006 and 2009, both times to Afghanistan. Just to give you a, a snapshot of the JAG branch in Canada compared to here in the United States, for instance, it's obviously very small. Uh, there are only approximately 150-ish uh, judge advocates, Army, Navy, Air Force combined. And I believe at any one time during our uh, deployments to Afghanistan, we had about 30 percent of our force was deployed at any one time. We had a deployment in the Congo and other deployments, but certainly the majority of judge advocates were in Afghanistan. So that being said, the nature of the force, uh, certainly for a smaller coalition like Canada, was that myself, as a major, was tasked as the quote-unquote senior legal advisor uh, on both deployments to the Canadian Task Force commander, who was a colonel. So that brings me to the first, uh, the first challenge, uh, really, is in dealing with coalition operations, and I, I certainly apologize to my American brethren who are here, and, and you would know this, is, is the sheer size and force of the what I will call the legal branch or judge advocates in the United States is quite, quite awe-inspiring from a, a smaller coalition partner. So to get the quote-unquote message across, and Commander Cameron alluded to this, about how it is so essential that we understand each other's ability to maneuver, quite frankly, which would include things like rules of engagement, operational orders, detainee treatment, detainee handling, detainee transfer. And certainly I can recall, and some of you may know a uh, 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 retired judge advocate, I believe he's retired, uh, Colonel uh, Man Manny Superville, who was the staff judge advocate at the time uh, in Kabul, as I show up, you know, in 2006, a major, you know, the senior legal advisor. And, and what struck me at the time, being my first deployment to Afghanistan, was the phalanx of lawyers that I, it took me to get to him. Uh, it was, you know, very nice and happy captains, majors, colonel, lieutenant colonels, and finally I get to him. And we had a conversation. He said, well, Steve, you know, very gracious. I mean, as, as you know, he's a, he's a wonderful man. And, and we were discussing just legal issues. So he said, well, who's, who sent you? Uh, I'm, uh, the task force commander sent me. Well, well, who's your chief of operational law? That would be me, sir. Okay, <laughs> military justice, right here, sir. Got it. Uh, <laughs> claims, that's you, sir. And, and I, I know our coalition partners, uh, certainly from Australia and, and uh, the UK, can, can empathize with that, that we are really the only show in town. And, and so the, sometimes the rank differential does play a factor in communicating the strategic message that we would receive from our you know, nas various national capitals and trying to get that across to the United States. It wasn't a particular problem with me, but I know it was an issue certainly with some judge advocates uh, in the past. Commander Cameron also alluded to the, the challenge of information sharing, and that is a practical reality, a practical challenge. I think we do a pretty good job uh, as we have matured, uh, certainly through the Afghan theater, and, and certainly Canada has not been in Iraq, so I only have the experience of Afghanistan. But I was... Uh, lucky enough or unlucky enough to be the first legal officer when Canada transitioned from a really a peace support operation in Kabul uh, and we went down to take over the PRT and the Kandahar province. So we're dealing with two operations from a Canadian standpoint, two operations, two rules of engagement. We're really going into an armed conflict scenario for the, you know, we were there in Afghanistan certainly before, but en masse for the first time. So it was critical to understand what the British could do, the Australians to a lesser extent, and certainly the, the United States. And as Commander Cameron mentioned, the, the, the famous no foreign, I mean, I can, I can you know, as my, my uh, fellow American judge advocates could probably uh, empathize with this, uh, the, you know, the coalition comes en masse, and that's another thing that we often do, is we often come en masse to get the voice across, and, and which also has other issues, because I think Sometimes we just don't know what each other can do. And there was, a, there was a question about the European Court of Human Rights. And I mean, I think that's another lesson learned is even as coalition partners, smaller coalition partners, we have to understand the legal impact of our own operations and respect those. So often I think, I mean, and I say this with great respect to the United States and, and the legal officers I work with who are great, but often because there, there's so many things going on, it's often viewed as the coalition voice and you know, and does that or does that not mesh with where, you know, the voice of the coalition writ large. 
So very often we'd have to deconflict, and I mean not just the, the esteemed panelists here from Australia and, and uh, the United Kingdom, other countries that may or may not, as it was alluded to, may or may not have rules of engagement, may or may not have an operational order, may decide to take the rules of engagements of the United States with no national caveats. So, and those have to be, so you can imagine from a practical perspective, if you're, look, if you're relying on the, uh, the helicopters of the United States and you have someone from the Netherlands and Canada and uh, Great Britain on a combined operation, there can be issues. And, and those are some issues that we certainly had to deal with. I'll make, uh, I'd like to also to mention an issue that is related to operations, and the reason I wanted to mention it was because it was alluded to today in this, this gum uh, scenario, which was, which was very, very interesting indeed, and is really the impact of how our respective military justice systems impact operations. And in particular, the uh, example I could give would be the negligent discharge, what we would call a negligent discharge. In Canada, if someone essentially fires their weapon without permission, you know, somehow, some way, that is a service offense. That is a criminal offense. And if you are at a certain rank, you will be court-martialed for that offense. And indeed, uh, a former task force commander at the Brigadier General level was brought back to Ottawa and court-martialed for, you know, really an accidental discharge. Now, I know certainly my American colleagues, that's a different system. Australia has, I think, a different uh, two-tier paradigm, unauthorized and negligent, I think. And, and, you know, there's a, a bit of a different system there. So how that impacts operations is also interesting. As you can imagine, you're taking out a task force commander, explaining that to the coalition. Why? Well, it was an unauthorized discharge. Whoa, okay. So how does that impact future operations? Uh, things like that. Again, one of the issues with a smaller coalition, I think, as a legal officer, setting the battle space, if you will, for your task force commander is, is really balancing this mission creep issue. Because as a smaller coalition, we want to come together. We want to, I'll say this in my own personal view, we want to prove ourselves. You know, certainly in Kandahar was my experience. We're here. We're, we're ready to go. And I was very blessed, honestly, to have task force commanders that were attuned to the national caveat. So it wasn't an issue. But, but that is always an issue as to understanding not only the legal paradigms, but also the operational paradigms that we operate in. And that's always an issue as a smaller coalition when you rely upon air transport, support in any way um, from bigger coalition partners. The last issue I want to touch on is really a cultural issue. Uh, and it's, it's interesting when deployed not only with the great uh, countries represented up here, but also other countries, and the impact that culture can play on operations. And for instance, uh, in Kandahar, uh, as my American colleagues know, uh, it is a dry, what they call quote unquote dry theater, no alcohol allowed. And in Kabul, when we were in Kabul, uh, Kabul for a period of time, we, there was alcohol permitted obviously in limited amounts uh, for the Canadian forces. And when we went to Kandahar, then we, it was a dry theater. But some nations that was not the case because it is, some, it is accepted. So obviously not only are you as a coalition deconflicting operational issues, rules of engagement, uh, operational orders, you're also deconflicting military justice issues and how the cultural impact of that and how you have to explain that to your task force commander who will have to have a conversation ultimately with uh, their colleagues, uh, their, their coalition colleagues. As to the way ahead, I will uh, wholeheartedly subscribe to what Commander Cameron said. Um, it seemed that the second time I was, I was deployed to Afghanistan, I felt I knew much less, exponentially less, than I did the first time. Uh, and, you know, my own ignorance aside, uh, to me it was really a, a lessons learned uh, experience where I think coalition, I mean, we have uh, exchange uh, officers uh, in the US JAG school in Charlottesville. But that being said, I really wanted to get across and highlight his point on operationalizing, if I can use that term, legal principles uh, and give them, and pra to, to coalition partners, to judge advocates to go forward because it seems that obviously, and this is an issue with the operators as well, but we seem to lag behind, years behind in passing on operational issues. And I know all the judge advocates out there, the panel included, uh, would understand the fact of deploying into theater, trying to not only do a handover, but also try to understand all these other cultural and coalition aspects. And it is not quite a Gordian knot, but it is very, very close. 
But in the end, um, I will say that it works. You know, we, we find a way to make it work. And as I see some heads nodding, and we do find a way to make it work. And as a Canadian legal officer, it has been an honor really to serve with, with all these great countries represented here. And we make it work as the best we can. And uh, as, a, uh, as a Canadian, it's uh, the way to go. Sir. Thank you very much, Steve. That was, that was really in insightful and appreciated hearing that, the candor from you. Uh, our most junior member of the panel is uh, Squadron Leader Joe Swainston. She um, received her Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Liverpool and her postgraduate diploma in legal practice from the College of Law in Chester in the year 2000. She joined the Royal Air Force in May of 2005 and uh, she deployed to the same location that uh, Colonel Preston was at. She was in the Air Operations Center. She's an RAF officer. And uh, I got to know her about two and a half years ago as she was sentenced. I guess she got in trouble in the UK or something because she was sent sentenced to work in the Pentagon uh, with, <laughs> with US uh, judge advocates. And that actually is part of a longstanding program that the Air Force, our, the US Air Force has where we exchange officers with both the UK and with, the, uh, with Australia. And it's been very productive working at the ends that we've been talking, talking about here. But uh, I'm, we're looking forward to hearing from you, Joe, your perspective from both being in the field in a coalition operation, but also being at the headquarters level. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to begin by firstly thanking Professor Dunlap and the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security for inviting me to participate in the panel discussion this afternoon. And to echo the remarks earlier made by um, Professor Dunlop, I'm indeed speaking in a personal capacity, um, not for the Royal Air Force, the Ministry of Defence, or the UK government. The dis traditional disclaimer out of the way. Um, before I address the, the panel topic specifically, um, I thought it'd be worthwhile to give you just a little bit more information of my recent experience, because that's obviously the experience that I'm drawing on. As Professor Dunlap said, I, support, I deployed in 2008 in support of air operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, and for the last two years, three months, I've been serving as the Royal Air Force Legal Exchange Officer, based within the Coalition Law Division and the Operations and International Law at the US Air Force Headquarters at the Pentagon, where I have the pleasure to work alongside an Australian Exchange Officer and also fellow US Air Force JAGs. So that's the perspective that, that I'll be uh, um, providing. I'm firstly going to consider the question of the lessons that I think we've learned and the challenges we face in the future um, by looking at the reality of the modern day operating environment and the challenges in that particular environment. Um, I also will um, outline the importance of military lawyers in modern day operations as a result of that uh, the operating environment and outline what I see as the, the key lessons learned essentially. Um, importance of knowing really which nations you're operating alongside or are involved in the operation. The importance of understanding the legal framework of those partner nations, um, so you understand what uh, legal framework that they are operating under. And very fundamentally important, um, relationships and communication. And also, because um, uh, one of our colleagues from the, the Army JAG School earlier um, raised the European Convention of Human Rights, I'm going to also take the opportunity of um, discussing briefly the, um, the influence of the European Convention of Human Rights and the um, court, U, European Court of Human Rights decisions, both on the British service or military justice system, because it's had a very significant impact, and also some recent court decisions which do have significant bearing on operations. And that's purely just to illustrate the importance of appreciating the impact of the European Court of Human Rights case law on the UK and other Council of um, Europe, Europe countries. So, firstly, if we're talking about the reality of the modern day operating environment, well, it's, it's such that most modern opera military operations are going to be multinational, exactly as the other panel men uh, members have mentioned. And I see that there are three reasons really for this reality. Firstly, well, we live in a complex world, so we're facing unpredictable and diverse threats that cannot be faced by a single country alone. Secondly, economic and fiscal challenges have necessitated reduce uh, defence budgets as our governments are trying to rebalance their books. And finally, 
multinational operations, of course, confer a degree of legitimacy on operations, which has already been alluded to, um, usually under the auspices of a UN Security Council resolution. But those are the three reasons that I, I think we have... Uh, I, I assert that the reality is that we're going to be um, undertaking multinational operations for the foreseeable future. And when I deployed primarily in support of operations in Afghanistan in 2008, I was working alongside US Air Force JAGs, but also Australian and French LIGADs. Now, in terms of the recent NATO operation in Libya, Operation Unified Protector, we had lawyers from nine different participating nations um, in that particular operation. So the reality is, modern day operations involve a lot of different countries, which means a lot of different lawyers, all working together to try to achieve the same mission. So that makes for a pretty big challenge, which may seem like I'm stating the obvious, um, but it's a challenge that we don't want to address on the first day of an operation. So that's why countries that are likely to participate in operations together, train together, conduct exercises together, have exchange programs like the one that I'm part of, um, have shared doctrine, such as NATO doctrine. Um, so we can increase our ability to operate together when we need to, and so that we, when we do deploy in operations, we can operate seamlessly and ultimately maximize mission success because that's what we're all looking to achieve. So moving on, um, the importance of military lawyers in modern day operations. Well, I don't think the importance can be overstated. Um, and I think that's evidenced by the number of lawyers that I talked about in terms of um, the recent operation in Libya and the number of lawyers involved in uh, operations in, in Afghanistan. Um, so why are military lawyers important? Again, I might be stating the obvious, but nations want to ensure the legitimacy of operations and adhere to their legal obligations in conducting operations. But also, um, any real or perceived lack of adherence to the law or indiscipline, which was, um, which was discussed really in, in the first panel this morning, can have, significant, uh, have a significant impact on operations. We all know that modern day technology and near real time reporting certainly means that um, worldwide we are seeing what's happening on the battlefield on television screens. There's increased media scrutiny and political scrutiny of actions and operations. And we know modern day adversaries can use the media um, to their advantage. So an action that can happen on the battlefield can have much greater significant consequences, strategic consequences. Um, and so that is from a big picture, big ops picture perspective, um, why um, lawyers are particularly important. And they're also extremely important because, and again, it seems like I'm stating the obvious, but all countries are different. Um, and my panel uh, colleagues here have already alluded to the fact that we have different cultures, different domestic politics, also different military histories. All these things shapes individual nations. So it will determine, um, obviously, their domestic politics. So firstly, whether or not a nation is going to participate in any given operation, whether they're going to be able to continue to participate in an operation. Um, it will shape their domestic law and also their international law obligations. So it's important to know um, uh, what international treaties that partner nations are signatories to, what international law obligations they have, um, to understand the framework in which, which they're operating. And I'm going to move, move at this point just to discuss briefly um, the European Convention of Human Rights, because it's a good, it's a good um, illustration, of, really, of, of, of this particular point. Um, the point that was, was quite correctly made earlier is that the, um, the European Convention of Human Rights and, and decisions in, in the European Court of Human Rights have had quite significant uh, impact upon the British service or military justice system over the last 15 years. Um, and in, in short, um, we had a, the UK had an adverse judgment in the European Court back in 1996, which deemed that an army court martial, our army court martial process wasn't independent and impartial under Article 6 of the European Court of Human Rights, which is, uh, provides for a right to a fair and impartial trial. And even though the problem was more of perception rather than reality, um, that um, necessitated significant changes to the, uh, our military justice system. Um, similarly, we've had other defeats in the, uh, the, the court. Um, we don't have uniform judges, for example, in our court martial system, like certainly we do in the US. 
um, because we were defeated in the uh, European Court in the case of Greaves, which preclude, which just prevented the Royal, Royal Navy, which was the only service actually who was using uniformed judges, from continuing to do that. So that's just to give you a, a bit of a, a, an overview, but um, as a result of um, the European Convention on Human Rights, basically uh, it's resulted in our service justice system changing quite significantly, and one of the significant changes for us is that we have a uh, tri-service prosecuting authority now, which is comprised of lawyers from all three services, which will try military personnel from any of the three services, and that's headed up by a civilian director of service prosecutions. I'm going to come back, because I've gone off on a little bit of a, of a tangent there, um, but my purpose in doing so is just to, to illustrate to you the, the importance um, uh, of uh, uh, an institution like the European Court of Human Rights for um, countries who are um, in the Council of Europe, because their case law is extremely significant. And we had two significant cases um, last July that were ultimately decided by the Grand Chamber um, in that court, um, cases of Al Jeddah and Al Skeni. Um, the first relating to a, uh, the detention of uh, an Iraqi, um, and the, the second, um, I can discuss the detail later in Q&A should you wish, but the second one was, was in relation to, um, uh, um, again in relation to Iraq, um, but and it basically discussed the extraterritorial application of the European Convention of Human Rights. And without drilling down to the details, the, the net effect um, of those cases and the full implications which are still being assessed by the UK is that um, detention op operations, as was alluded to earlier, is problematic for the UK, and we don't really know the, the full implications of those decisions. So, as I say, I, I raise that just because it's, from an awareness perspective, um, those countries that are working uh, in operations alongside European countries, you have to be mindful that there may be, may be some restraints upon what activities they can undertake as a result of um, the, that particular court's um, case law. Um, so if I come back and, and briefly just conclude in terms of discussing um, lessons learned, um, I think can be summarized by it's critical to know which countries are involved in an operation and therefore um, that uh, you are operating alongside to understand what they can and can't do for legal or political reasons um, and how that's going to affect the operation one of my biggest frustrations as a deployed UK lawyer was when I was repeatedly questioned why we couldn't do something, why we couldn't, the UK wouldn't strike a particular target or wouldn't, wouldn't take a certain action. And we were precluded by doing that by virtue of, say, legal or political reasons. Um, and that was just a, a lack of understanding from those people asking me about the, um, the, the, the law under which we were operating. Um, so understanding, gaining understanding is, is a big, a big um, thing. And the importance of building relationships and particular communications to get that understanding is absolutely critical, as, as my panel members have already, um, uh, already said. And yes, other challenges. You may be using, may be using different computer systems. Um, we may have releasability or classification issues, which makes it very difficult. Um, we, I, we even struggled sharing um, documents with our French, uh, the French League who joined us initially. Um, uh, so it can be challenging, and and when you and realistically, um, going back to something that uh, uh, was mentioned very early on, um, you shouldn't also assume that uh, comprehension or that everything that you will say will be understood. I've been in the States now for and in the Pentagon for the last two years and three months, and I still, on a number of occasions, struggle to be understood, and for people to understand me. And um, so even though we do speak the, speak the same language, um, we, those, those challenges do, do exist and, and have to be worked out. Well, when I was on active duty, I used to make Joe come down and brief me on stuff. I just like listening to her. <laughs> uh, I have a million questions, but what I thought we'd do is go to your questions first because we, we, ha we do have some time. All right, thank, thank you. Um, Tom Earhart again uh, from the Air Force. I just want to say, first of all, um, that as, a, as someone who, who had a 30-year career in, in the uh, Air Force, that if we're continuing to attract this caliber of person into our services and into our JAG Corps, 
I have great hopes that that not only coalition operations, but but just that our militaries are are have a have a future that's that's really going to be solid and, and well taken care of because of, of, of the caliber of people that we're bringing into this. So it's a very impressive panel, I must say. I'm going to throw you a tough one because um, you deserve it. <laughs> uh, and that is under the, the umbrella of technology. So we're talking about a lot of sort of soft issues here. You know, we all want to get along, and I get that. But Technology is also one of the things that divides us, and I want to mention two things. The first is that just on its own terms, military technology has advanced dramatically in the last 10 and 20 years. And each one of our countries employs it in a different way or employs different calibers of technologies, and, and the legal profession has to deal with that. And I'm just going to mention three. The first one is the expansion of precision technology. This has changed in many ways what the, the, the legal profession has to do for us in the military because now, more than any time in, in our, our past, we can hit exactly what we want to hit. With, and, and these kinds of weapons that we have work in particular ways that are incomprehensible to most people. And the new kinds of weapons and new kinds of sensors that we bring online continue, must be a challenge to you, and I'd like you to comment about that type of technology. The second part is surveillance technology has expanded dramatically. The difference between even the resolution on a Predator unmanned aerial vehicle video when I was involved with Enduring Freedom in 2001 and 10 years later, just the resolution, the ability to see exactly what you're looking at has come so far it just is absolutely stunning and it has legal ramifications and I, and I ask you to talk about that and the and the the piano on your back is the third one which is cyber so we have a whole ex this is the place where technology advances the fastest the the technology cycle is the quickest we have new tools every day, literally, that, that we have questions about whether or not we can use them. Can the military use offensive cyber, for instance, and, and actually go out through the, through the internet, let's say, and attack someone else's cyber? So I, I would like you to comment about any or all of those, if you would, and talk about how it's changed what you do as a JAG um, as, over in your military experience. Sure, if I could take that one to start with. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Earhart, for your kind words about the panel, because uh, it's true that our coalition partners send their best people uh, forward. My main claim to fame is I'm at 4th Fighter Wing in Goldsboro, North Carolina, which is a short 70-minute drive from here. Um, <laughs> But, but it's, it's, a, it's a great question, and it illustrates what Joe was talking about and others um, about the challenge of a coalition, and, and, part, and Hugh also. Um, you know, high-tech militaries you're, you're, are, you're seeing here uh, represented in, the, in this panel. But, you know, we have some more low-tech uh, members that we want to participate at well, as well, yet we're held to the, the high expectations of, of, like you say, the precision-guided munitions, um, the intelligence we can glean through the surveillance technology you talk about, um, as well as our ability to monitor with cyber. Well, well, that takes that creates an expectation. This gets back to my theme about do we really understand our capabilities and how, how to wield them, um, and, and what can we really expect of that soldier, sailor, airman, marine on the ground um, in terms of the, the precision we expect of them. You know, um, lots of different discussion. Discussion about UAVs is, is, is very much uh, armed UAVs and, and how precise they are. Well, you know, what, what does the media tell you about that? It, it, the implication is that we have these kind of mindless uh, targeting decisions out, not even targeting decisions, simply, you know, uh, indiscriminate use of force, right? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you know, you know what's going on there, it, it's extremely precise. And, um, and one of the challenges in, in building that coalition, I'll just mention this one in, in our communication, is to say, how do we wield that force and, and, you know, to an appropriate level um, in terms of compliance with the law of armed conflict um, while still keeping that coalition together while, while, while creating realistic expectations? And, and that's a lot of the external message we try to create through our internal workings as, as coalition JAGs. You and Steve 
let's hear let's hear from all three of you actually on the on this important because it may be the only question we can fit in. So, um, I, I, look, I'd only say two things. I would say that on those first two points about precision ammunition and also uh, surveillance technology, I think the increase of that has had an exponential pressure point on legal officers. And I go back to Joe's point when she was obviously getting harangued in the chaos one day about why the UK couldn't do certain things. I think where we've got to this technology at the moment is that uh, when, when you're told you can't do it because the lawyers don't get a warm and fuzzy, the response can be, I don't understand why not. This is precise. This is why we've got precise weapons and precise ammunition. It won't make a mistake. Um, so it is terrific, but there's increased pressure and then uh, a desire to justify your arguments as to why we perhaps don't want to invoke that particular target for whatever reason. And I'll, um, I'll defer on the cyber, except as an interested observer, I once thought that increase in cyber uh, related things under rules of engagement was someone's Xbox being stolen. But over the last <laughs> 10 years, I have really been an interested observer, whilst not an expert observer, looking at rules of engagement and how they are now including cyber acts. Uh, and I think it's one of the most fascinating areas of where we'll go, which doesn't answer your question, but from an Australian uh, coalition perspective, we're, we're, we're on board, and I'm not an expert to be able to give you a more in-depth answer on that. Tom, one of the things that your question really underlines is the enormous burden on military lawyers to have technical expertise and a depth of knowledge of the, quote, client's business, which totally unprecedented from, you know, 20 year, years ago or 30 years ago when when we started, uh, and the require, and especially the technology in cyber, and I, I think Rob made an excellent point. Uh, a lot of people misunderstand what precision weapons are and how complicated that targeting process is, and the amount of information and the validation process and so forth. It is extraordinarily complex, and in fact, Joe backed me on this. <laughs> Just learning how to use the computer systems in the Air Operations Center is phenomenally complex because some of those computer systems do not exist anywhere else in the world. And they are not easy, Rob, you know what I mean. We send people to a two-month school just to learn how to use, well, for some other things, but a big part of it is learning how to use the computer system. Steve and Joe, let's... Yeah, that's, that's, that is an excellent question, sir, and if I... I, I can't recall if I threw out my uh, caveat as my colleagues so uh, aptly did, but I better do that because this is a very interesting question. So I, I am certainly <laughs> speaking for myself, nor the fine government of Canada or the Office of the Judge Advocate General. But just, ju just your first two questions, sir, the precision weapons, precision technology, surveillance technology, as, as General Dunlap alluded to, that's really knowing your client. Uh, and I mean, certainly from the Canadian Forces perspective, from any legal officer perspective, obviously we have to know what they do and, and there's increased pressure on understanding not only the law but the technology. I think from a coalition perspective, however, the challenge is, is when you're operating in a coalition with technology that uh, is not your own. So then, for instance, you are reliant upon your subject matter experts to explain to you the, 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 the technology of the coalition partner, I suppose. I mean, that's, that is a challenge. Uh, with regards to your cyber, I will take that one on. Um, I think your question was very perceptive, and I'm not sure if ex the, the nature of cyber writ large is exactly why we created uh, fairly recently the Directorate of Information, uh, Inform uh, Intelligence and Information Operations in the Office of the JAG, but I'm sure that had something to do with it. I've never worked in that directorate, nor do I have experience, but it, it has. it is a recent subdirectorate in our uh, directorate uh, of operations. So certainly that, uh, that speaks to the, the, the emergence of that type of uh, legal aspects to what we do. Joe, do you have any comments on that? Just a very general one. I think, I think all the points that you raised um, just all indicate um, a requirement probably for an increased or um, need for kind of legal review and involvement in talking in terms of development of cyber, for, for lawyers to be involved early on, to have a good technical understanding, to be able to, 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 um, to, to give meaningful advice. In terms of the surveillance technology expansion, um, a lot more information is going to be available for commanders, so they will they'll look to their JAGs 
um, for, for guidance and in terms of precision technology. Um, as, as we get advances in precision technology, there will be more and more expectation for there to be no civilian casualties, no collateral damage, all those things, and uh, so commanders will, will rely heavily again um, on their JAGs in uh, the whole kind of process of using those weapons. Well, thank you very much, Joe. And I'd like to echo something that, um, that uh, Rob and Tom, I think, alluded to. It really is amazing that we have this kind of legal talent, not just in the U.S. Armed Forces, but in our coalition partners. It's really awe-inspiring. And the, one of the things that I found is that when you're on an operation, whatever may be the differences between the countries, or for that matter, between the U.S. military services, the lawyers seem to glom together and work as a team in a way that is, is really inspiring and really gives meaning to the idea of a coalition operation. So back to uh, our ops here, so to speak. Uh, what's the schedule for tomorrow? We're starting a little bit later. Please note the start time of the Continental. It's not, it's not that shocking, but... Uh, <laughs> And the, the panel, first panel tomorrow will start at 8.30. And you can park for free in the law school lot. So it won't be down in at Science Drive. Where, there's the law school. Here's where you are right now. You probably walked down from down Science Drive and entered the front. Well, tomorrow you can go in, go down Tower View, go into the lot, and then enter the law school from there. Tonight, the reception and dinner. If you signed up for it, it is tonight. It's usually somebody tomorrow morning. Oh, isn't that this evening? <laughs> isn't that Saturday night? No, it's tonight. It's Friday night. The reception starts at 6.15. My wife is in charge of uh, staying in touch with the big guy upstairs, and he's arranged for some terrific weather, so I, I'm really excited about the, the reception. We're going to have General Mike Hayden, the former director of the CIA, as our dinner speaker. And where the Washington Duke Inn is, you see where we are now. But you just you just go straight down uh, Science Drive and it's right at the end of Science Drive there. And please be sure to wear your aim tag, which is my last takeaway here. Let's take this opportunity at the reception and the dinner to get to know each other because this whole community that's interested in these kinds of issues is really not all that large. So I think it's important that we take this opportunity to get to know each other. Thank you very much, and see you this evening. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.